Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Quam. I'm the uh, secretary with All Aboard Minnesota. I will be your uh, Zoom host here today. And uh, before we get started here with our meeting, I just want to go over a quick couple of Zoom protocols here for everybody. Um, we do have everybody on mute, and so uh, we will not be uh, taking live uh, voice questions. So if you have a question or a comment or anything uh, that comes up here, uh, we will put it in the uh, chat box. Uh, hopefully everybody is able to hear me at this time. I have uh, somebody in our chat box said they couldn't hear me. Uh, hopefully I'm being heard. Um, <clears throat> we're basically going to have three uh, question and answer periods during the uh, Zoom meeting here. Uh, our first question and comment period will be uh, 10 minutes and that'll be after uh, Frank Lauderly is done presenting with uh, uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation. Our second, uh, question and comment period will be after Kevin Roganbuck speaks with the Great River Rail Commission. And then at the end, we'll also have a uh, comment and question period at that time. We will uh, try to answer most questions, but if we don't uh, get all of the uh, questions to everybody, uh, what we'll do then is uh, do a follow-up from All Aboard Minnesota, and you can uh, submit your questions uh, through All Aboard Minnesota's website. Um, for any of you that are new to Zoom, uh, we do have a, a chat box feature. Uh, if you're not familiar where the chat box icon feature is, it's located down on the lower part of your chat screen. And uh, basically just uh, put your question in there and we will address it there. So uh, at this time, I'm going to hand the uh, meeting over to Brian and I will unmute Brian here in a minute here and then we'll get going here. Sure, and then we'll get Okay, uh, it's all yours, Brian. Okay. Uh, Great, thanks so much, Mark. Good morning, everybody. This is Brian Nelson, uh, board member with All Aboard Minnesota. We're thrilled that all of you can join us this, this morning. We have a action-packed hour and a half for you with a lot of good information about what's happening with passenger rail in Minnesota and the upper Midwest. And so we'll go through some background and context of what's going on in Minnesota, but we have four really great speakers lined up for you today. Um, first is Frank Lauderly from Minnesota Department of Transportation State Rail Office to talk about updates on the second train frequency between the Twin Cities and Chicago, State Rail Plan, Twin Cities to Duluth service. Uh, Representative Alice Hausman will begin talking about what's happening in the state legislature with passenger rail legislation. Uh, so she'll give us the latest developments on that. Um, our great partner and ally for many years, the Great River Rail Commission, Kevin Roganbuck will give us uh, an update on what they've been doing and their plans. And then Scott Rogers from the Midwest Interstate Rail Passenger Coalition will talk about some of the other developments that are happening in the upper Midwest in terms of new passenger rail corridors, um, updates of existing frequencies and things like that. And again, we'll, we have about 30 minutes planned for question and answers as Mark um, outlined. And so we'll attempt to get to all of your questions and answers. So with that, why don't we get into the meat of it? Next slide, please. So there's two new passenger rail pieces of legislation that I wanted to let you all know about. The first one listed there is House File 3160, which All Aboard Minnesota helped to write that was introduced in the Minnesota House by Representative Alice Hausman. We did find a Senate co-sponsor, co-author, Jennifer McEwen. And what that passenger rail legislation does is it would enable MnDOT to really blow out the state rail plan and begin studying four main components. The first of which would be to extend the second train frequency between the Twin Cities and Chicago up to Fargo-Moorhead on the existing Empire Builder line on a daytime schedule. We've conducted a number of outreach sessions north of uh, St. Paul, and there's a tremendous amount of interest in that service. So it would allow MnDOT to study that route, the preliminary design, cost benefit, things like that. Um, the second component in that bill would allow MnDOT to study new passenger service south of the Twin Cities that would go through 
Northfield, Owatonna, Albert Lee, to Des Moines and Kansas City. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. The third thing would be enabling MnDOT to study a maintenance facility to service a lot of these new routes. And then the fourth component is MnDOT study for a dedicated passenger main line between the two downtowns of Minneapolis and St. Paul to allow a good artery for passenger rail between the two cities. The second major component, and this is very exciting for all of us, is House File 2628, which appropriates $85 million from the state of Minnesota to get uh, federal matching funds to enable the new Twin Cities to Duluth service. As we've talked about before, that service, that route is what's called shovel ready. All the studies are done, they're completed, they're ready to go. Um, and so these funds would allow MnDOT to begin construction on that line, Twin Cities to Duluth, to begin passenger service. And that bill, House File 2628, was included, is now included in the House Transportation Bill. So that's a very exciting development. We're very excited that, that that's in there. Now the House and the Senate transportation bills have to come together uh, in order for a final bill. And the two bills are fairly far apart. Uh, Representative Hausman will talk a little bit more about that. But um, we are excited that, that that bill is included in the House transportation bill. So with all of that, we, All Aboard Minnesota, provided testimony to the House Transportation Finance Committee as well as the House Capital Invest Investment Committee on House File 3160, which I just mentioned, the four different studies. We not only provided written testimony, but we provided verbal testimony. And then we followed up with legislators in both of those committees. We were able to meet with about half of each but one of the more significant meetings that we had was with Representative Dean Erdahl, who is the ranking GOP minority member um, in the House Capital Investment Committee. And to his credit, he was very interested to learn more about the passenger rail issue. His caucus has raised significant concerns about the North Star commuter rail line. And so we wanted to meet with him to educate him about passenger rail in Minnesota, what it can do. He did seem very interested. A couple key points that he was very interested in was the fact that passenger rail uses existing infrastructure and the fare box recovery ratio for Amtrak before COVID, which was around 90%. So hopefully we influenced his thinking on that and um, hopefully we garnered his support. So lots of meeting with, with legislators, but we feel that it's worth it worth the time and investment. Another significant development this spring is one of our board members, Bob Moen, researched and analyzed the Twin Cities to Kansas City route that I mentioned. And he wrote up a very extensive paper about what it would look like to restore passenger rail on that route. And his findings were very positive. One is that Union Pacific that owns that line invested, has invested about $300 million over the past five years to upgrade that route. And the route, as Bob found, definitely has capacity to host passenger rail. And more, even more importantly, it would gain some pretty significant ridership. So the route is ripe for restoration of passenger service, and it would be a very important north to south rail link for Minnesota and the upper Midwest. That paper is summarized on our website in the Our Vision section, Twin Cities to Kansas City page. Some of the key findings from that paper are summarized there for your review. We gave that, that entire paper and write up to MnDOT as they consider studying that route. So hopefully that helps them uh, in terms of some of the things that they're gonna look at as well. Finally, uh, the Big Sky Passenger Rail Coalition Commission in Montana was formed in 2020 to reestablish passenger rail service through Southern Montana. And one of the key routes through Southern Montana was formerly the North Coast Hiawatha. Uh, under railroad operations, it was called the North Coast Limited. 
but it ran from Chicago to Seattle through Minnesota, serving Southern Montana and uh, Southern North Dakota. And one of the key developments here is that in the Infrastructure and Jobs Act that was passed by US Congress, in the rail appropriation part of that, there was about $12 million, I think that's the right figure, that was appropriated for the Federal Railroad Administration to study routes that have been long distance routes that have been discontinued by Amtrak. And so one of the routes that is gonna be included in that FRA study is the North Coast Hiawatha. So we're very excited about that. All Aboard Minnesota has been a strong component for restoration of that route ever since our inception. And so we're very excited to see what that study produces. The route was studied by Amtrak in 2009 and the results were very encouraging from a ridership perspective. So we'll keep you posted as those developments unfold. Next slide. One of the key things that All Aboard Minnesota has done that we found are, is very effective with the legislature is to pass city and county resolutions endorsing passenger rail. So last year, we worked up and down the Empire Builder line from Fargo-Moorhead to La Crescent and got eight cities to pass new resolutions that they're in support of passenger rail through their communities. So we're gonna build on that work this year. This fall, we're gonna work with Northfield, Faribault, Owatonna, and Albert Lee to hopefully pass resolutions for their support. But again, legislators really take notice of that. That's, it's, it's an important tool. It's one of the best things that we can do from an advocacy perspective to show support throughout the state. So we're gonna continue that work. And of course, our work continues on the Twin Cities to Duluth line and partnering with Northern Lights Express Alliance. The other new thing that we're gonna produce and we'll be releasing in about two to three weeks is a new video that talks about passenger rail from the vantage point of personal stories. What it's designed to do is several different demographics will be represented in the video to talk about what passenger rail means to them, why it's important, why they use it, to really get the word out, to connect with people about how passenger rail can benefit them. And so we're very excited to release that. We'll be um, previewing that at train days at St. Paul Union Depot on June 4th and 5th. Um, but just know that we'll be using that in the cities, counties, uh, and towns throughout the state to promote passenger rail service. Our meetings with US legislators continue. We've maintained good contacts and relationships with Senator Klobuchar's office, Senator Tina Smith's office, and Rep Betty McCollum's office to keep them engaged about the passenger rail scene in Minnesota and how it affects national policy and things like that. So our work continues there. Next slide, please. So on this slide, I know many of you have probably seen this map before, but just to give you a visual reference of the routes that I've just mentioned, um, again, you know, we're, our work continues on Twin Cities to Duluth. Um, if you look at the line from Minneapolis to Fargo, that line represents uh, additional daytime passenger service from Fargo-Moorhead to St. Paul. And then the middle red line that I talked about before is the route from um, Twin Cities down to Albert Lee connecting us to Des Moines and Kansas City. And it is a very significant key line. There was passenger rail service up through 1969 on that route. Um, it was a very popular train um, and that would connect us to Amtrak service that would um, lead us to areas like Phoenix, Los Angeles, Denver, San Francisco, and we wouldn't have to go through Chicago to connect to those trains. So it would be a very vital north-south link. And again, as Bob modeled, it would have very robust ridership. So that's just a visual of our route focus for 2022 and beyond, and we'll keep you posted as all of these things develop. Next slide. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Barb Toman, who is a member of All Aboard Minnesota. She is spearheading two initiatives to enhance the rail passenger scene uh, and passenger experience at St. Paul Union Depot. So with that, Barb, I'll let you present. All right. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, welcome, everyone. 
Um, as Brian said, I'm a volunteer, one of many at All Aboard Minnesota, and uh, the membership is extremely excited about the start um, of the second daily train. And as we all sort of anticipate and plan for that service, a, a number of us got thinking about how to ensure that the new service is as successful uh, as possible, successful from the perspective of both robust ridership, but also the customer experience. And so what I'm gonna do briefly here in this five minutes is talk about two initiatives that we are um, thinking about and, and hoping to uh, work in partnership to implement. Um, the first of these is improving the signage at the St. Paul Union Depot. Um, as, as frequent riders of passenger rail, our members wait uh, for trains at the St. Paul Union Depot, but also at rail stations throughout North America. So we have observed and experienced how people use the stations and what's important to them. And I personally spent many hours this past spring at the Union Depot talking with riders about funding for a second daily train. And as we all know, the depot, it's a big and beautiful place. It has many entrances and exits. Um, and staff from Jefferson Line and Amtrak are located one floor below where the passengers wait and where they board. So a group of us got together. We did quite a lot of brainstorming and some planning. And we took a tour of the Union Depot. And then we developed some recommendations for improving the experience for customers and for passengers. And these recommendations, and there were 14 of them, were focused primarily on improving signage both inside and outside of the St. Paul Union Depot building. And then in March, we sent a letter outlining these recommendations to Mr. Edward Kim, and he is the Amtrak facilities manager for the central region. Um, we also sent a copy to Ramsey County board chair, uh, Masta Castillo. So Mr. Kim responded right away to our letter. He expressed interest in talking more and engaging with our members in Ramsey County and Ramsey of County, of course, is the building owner. So we'll be following up with Mr. Kim and also asking for a meeting um, with Ramsey County. So that's the first initiative is improving signage um, and, and a few other things at the depot. Um, the second idea that All Aboard Minnesota believes could contribute um, to the success of the second train is something called a station host program. And those of you who have traveled on some of the routes in the Amtrak system may be familiar with these station host programs. Sometimes they're called station ambassador programs. Um, there are quarter specific programs um, along the down Easter route, which is between Boston and Brunswick, Maine. There's two programs, there's um, on state supported service um, that are corridor wide, one in North Carolina, another in Northern California. And then there are many, many individual station host programs in particular cities at particular stations, including um, Olympia, Washington, Burlington, Iowa, Kirkwood, Missouri, and many others. So these station host programs can dramatically improve um, the customer experience and they can build support for travel by train, improve passenger safety um, and promote and support local attractions and businesses. So typically these host programs are, are formalized through an agreement among a nonprofit organization like All Aboard Minnesota and the station owner and Amtrak. And host volunteers are, are trained, they're certified, and they commit to volunteering a certain number of shifts um, each month. Um, Amtrak encourages station host programs. And in fact, Amtrak has developed a 50 page guidebook about how to initiate and run a host program. So there's a lot of resources out there on, on how to do this. So we also did a little of our own research about the most successful programs around the country, phoned and talked with many of them to, to really understand as best we could how they're organized, operated and funded. And then we wrote a paper summarizing that. Um, so just briefly, um, a program that I found particularly impressive and I think all board Minnesota members have, many of them have, have experienced um, the hosts um, at this program is a program in Kirkwood, Missouri, 
And Kirkwood is located very close to St. Louis and they have a host program with 50 volunteers. Um, they, and that's a, enough volunteers to meet every train and keep the station staffed from eight in the morning till 5 p.m. every day. Um, and the station hosts there, and, and on my slide, you'll see a picture um, of people in these blue shirts, and those are folks at the uh, Kirkwood, Missouri station. So they, they talk to residents about local attractions, about services, about parking and transit, about how to use the ticket vending machines. And the volunteers work, um, two of them work on each shift typically. And then they have additional volunteers on Fridays and whenever there are special events. So over the coming months, All Aboard Minnesota will continue to do some thinking about a host program for the St. Paul Union Depot. Um, and we'll also develop a proposal and then ask to meet with Ramsey County and Amtrak. Amtrak. And certainly a host program would be possible, not just at Union Depot, but also um, in Red Wing and in Winona. Um, but we just thought let, we'll, we might start with, with the Union Depot. Um, so anything, anyway, if this, if this is of interest to you, we hope that you will let us know and we would, we would certainly include you um, on the planning committee. Um, so that, that summarizes my part um, of the agenda here and the two programs that we are interested in and the initiatives we're working on that we hope will contribute to the success of the second daily train. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barb, for that. Appreciate it. Next slide, please. Um, so again, All Aboard Minnesota is a all volunteer organization. We rely on your support, your membership, your donations, and we really thank you for all of that support. It allows us to keep doing all the things that we've just talked about. And one of the most important things that we that you can do as a citizen advocate for passenger rail is call your legislators, let them know how much you want and value more passenger rail service in Minnesota, and we'll keep you posted on a lot of the development that we've talked about this morning. So again, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for your membership. Thank you for your support. We can't do it without you. We really appreciate it. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Frank Lauderly, who is with the MnDOT State Rail Passenger Office to give us an update on some very exciting developments. Frank, take it away. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, as, uh, as, you, uh, as you know, I, uh, I work for the Minnesota Department of Transportation in the uh, Office of Freight Commercial Vehicle Operations, and I supervise the rail and freight planning section, which includes uh, managing passenger rail activities. So and, uh, I want to talk about three different things today, the, uh, the second train to Chicago, Analex, and the state rail plan. The... Um, uh, First of all, in terms of the second train to um, Chicago, I, I think everybody knows uh, here already that we have uh, funding in place to build the capital improvements uh, that have been requested by Canadian Pacific to allow operation of uh, an additional Amtrak train between Chicago and, and St. Paul. Um, we have, uh, we are in the, in the stage of the, the process right now is basically we're doing a lot of agreements. Um, we have to put together uh, several different agreements in order to uh, manage the, the operation of the train. First of all, um, we're working very closely with Wisconsin uh, Department of Transportation on uh, the uh, uh, development of the final engineering and the construction of the improvements. Now, um, uh, you should know that uh, the, the federal grant, the Chrissy grant that is supporting this project is actually something that uh, is uh, between uh, FRA and WSDOT. Uh, they, they actually applied for the grant. We have a, a agreement in place uh, between WSDOT and MnDOT as to how to manage the construction and the payment for, uh, for these engineering improvements. We have selected a, a firm, uh, a, a team of HNTB and HDR to do the engineering work. And um, they have it, um, uh, the kickoff for that is, is in the next two or three weeks uh, in which they will actually start 
uh, performing the work. Uh, up to this point, uh, we've had to go through the procurement process. We've had to negotiate the contract. We're at the point now where we're ready to begin uh, the work on the engineering. So um, the, the engineering process is underway. Uh, we will begin actual work here in a couple of weeks. Um, another thing that we are working on is an operating agreement uh, between um, uh, WISDOT and MINDOT in terms of how we share the cost of uh, running the train. Now, um, as you know, uh, the second train being a state supported train means that the, the states are uh, responsible for um, making up the shortfall between the, the fares and the overall operating cost. So uh, we are in the process of negotiating an agreement between Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. So since we don't have that agreement in place, I can't share the details with you, but um, I believe that we've got uh, a fair proposal in place. And again, uh, um, in this uh, you know, negotiating an agreement phase, we're, we're working on uh, getting in place the, the formal agreement to share amongst the three states the cost of, of operating the train. Um, <clears throat> in addition, we have to have an agreement with Amtrak. Um, and we've been uh, negotiating with Amtrak. Um, we're in the very early stages, but the um, one of the things that we determined uh, just recently is that in fact, we will have a separate agreement with Amtrak between Minnesota there'll be an agreement between Minnesota and Amtrak, Wisconsin and Amtrak, and Illinois and Amtrak. Um, and so we are working on the, um, as part of our state to state agreement, we're working on the details of how uh, we're going to share the responsibility of overseeing the second train. Um, you know, Minot is going to, you know, reserve some, um, um, uh, some rights to make decisions, and we have to work with WISDOT to figure out how we're going to share those those responsibilities. So again, uh, and I wish I could share more details, but we're, we are in the middle of discussing that, so I can't give you too much, but other, other than to say that we're going to certainly um, uh, do, our, do what we need to do to, to represent Minnesota in that. Now, um, one thing that is... Um, a little different perhaps than what you might have heard um, in the past is that as part of the um, the Canadian Pacific's effort to merge with the Kansas City Southern, uh, Canadian Pacific has been looking around for support and they have approached Amtrak, they approached Amtrak and, and asked for their support for the merger and uh, so there is an agreement in place between Amtrak and the Canadian Pacific that basically says that in exchange for, you know, uh, Amtrak support that uh, CP is willing to allow uh, passenger rail service in a couple of corridors before all of the engineering work is done. So what that means for the second train is that rather than waiting for all of the improvements that we've um, um, committed to and have agreed to with Canadian Pacific, Canadian Pacific says, well, you can go ahead and start the train early. Well, um, that uh, kind of puts our, our work um, uh, in, in, it's certainly turned everything on its head, you know, when we found that out, because now, in addition to just working on the engineering, now we have to actually work with Amtrak to figure out how they're going to run the train. Now, Amtrak has been very excited about starting service as soon as they can, but as soon as they can is uh, still it's going to take a little bit of time. At this point in time, we think that we will be able to start uh, uh, an initial level of service perhaps by the beginning of the calendar year. Uh, this may only be three trains a day, um, three round trips a day, I should say, initially. Um, but as I say, uh, Amtrak is very interested in getting something, something on the ground as quickly as possible. So um, I was hoping that by today I would be able to share a few more details about what that would look like. But um, um, Amtrak has balls in their court right now to provide us with some very, with some detailed, um, with a detailed proposal. 
and I don't have any of that information in hand. And once we get it, I need to, you know, spend some time reviewing that. But over the next couple of months, uh, what's going to happen, you know, with us, what we're going to be doing is working with Amtrak to define what do they mean exactly by initial service? What do, what days of the week are they proposing? What, what exactly will the schedule be? Uh, where the crew change is going to be, all of the, the, the nitty gritty details of how this service is actually going to be conducted. Uh, we will be working with Amtrak over the next couple of months to figure that out. And our hope is that we will be able to be providing service here instead of in two years within the next few months. And, and when I say the beginning of the calendar year, that's a real shot in the dark at this point. Um, and I want you to understand that uh, uh, there is nothing firmly in place yet, but we are we are working very hard uh, with Wisconsin and Illinois and Amtrak to make this happen early. So that's my report on the second train. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out is that uh, we did not anticipate having to pay operating costs this quickly. So the governor has uh, $740,000 in his supplemental budget to pay for the initial operating cost, uh, and then we are going to have to secure uh, operating funding to continue to operate the train uh, past this um, um, past this first year. the The proposed start date for the second train. There is no specific date for starting the train. We are negotiating that right now. Um, we don't have a proposed date at this time. What we are saying is that. We believe that we can get service uh, potentially at the beginning of next calendar year. And um, again, nothing is firmly in place yet. That's the negotiation. That's what Amtrak is trying to propose. We're not ready to agree to that yet. We need to work on the operating plan. We are waiting for Amtrak to provide us with the details on what exactly they're proposing. So. Um, uh, the, the, the good news is that we think that we can get service started earlier than we expected, um, but um, we are we were right in the middle of the very detailed uh, discussions with Amtrak and with Wisconsin on figuring out how to do that. So I saw that question pop up in the chat. Was there another, um, let's see. Yes, okay, so um, that's, that's, uh, that's the second train. Um, as far as NLX is concerned, uh, the, the truth is that MnDOT is not really uh, doing very much right now. The, our supporters in, uh, on the Passenger Rail Alliance and in Duluth are very, very active this year, uh, uh, trying to get funding through the legislature. We're providing uh, uh, the Alliance and, and our supporters with as much information as we can. Um, I think that uh, when uh, Representative Houseman comes on. She can she can discuss more details about uh, that funding effort. But we are of course uh, ready to support that effort as well. Um, the state rail plan. Um, we to to quote one of my colleagues, uh, the state rail plan has finally left the roundhouse, and uh, we got a head of steam up, and we're 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 ready to start moving on that. We are actually uh, very close to issuing a request for proposal for a consultant. Um, we're actually planning to hire two separate consultants, two separate contracts, because uh, what I would like to do is have the public engagement contract as a separate contract from what we would call the planning consultant. So um, we, are, <clears throat> we are right at the point where we, where we are um, filing the paperwork with our consultant services division to, um, to, to work on getting the, uh, the RFP published. We think that we will have an RFP out on the street in uh, perhaps four to six weeks. Uh, we are also working on the scope of work for the planning consultant. So uh, that may be uh, a few weeks behind, uh, but in either case by, um, by, by midsummer, we will have RFPs on the street for two contracts to support the writing of the state rail plan. And our hope is that we would have the state rail plan uh, completed in about 18 months. Um, uh, again, we don't have <clears throat> a, a lot of details yet because that's, uh, again, we're going to, when we uh, get proposals from consultants, we will be negotiating 
the exact details of how we're going to move forward. But uh, I'll tell you that the reason why I, uh, I pushed for having a separate public engagement consultant is because uh, we wanted to very we wanted to really emphasize that that aspect of the state rail plan this go round, including uh, a very robust um, effort to engage the public on passenger rail. And by having the um, public engagement consultant as a separate contract, rather than as a subcontract to the planning consultant, uh, we, we have, we exercise a great deal more control over that process. And, and uh, we have direct contact with that, that contractor. So um, the state rail plan um, is moving forward. Um, we should have <clears throat> uh, requests for proposal out on the street in, in a few weeks and then begin the process of uh, soliciting and interviewing potential consultants and, and hopefully by the third quarter uh, be underway with that process. So um, that's a short summary of what's happening in the passenger rail office. Um, there's a, a lot happening at the, at the legislature, but I'm gonna just stay focused on what I'm working on. Uh, so just to summarize with TCMC, we're in uh, very detailed negotiations with Amtrak, Wisconsin and, and Illinois on the exact details of how to operate the train. We hope that we can have a, an initial uh, level of service, perhaps three trains, three round trips a day by the beginning of the calendar year. Uh, with NLX, we are uh, supporting um, the effort to gain funding by providing information and background uh, to our supporters and the state rail plan. Uh, we expect to have RFPs out on the street in a few weeks and to have consultants under contract uh, by the third quarter. So that's, that's, uh, that's my report today. Excellent, thank you so much, Frank. Uh, and now we'll take some time if anybody has any questions for Frank or myself based off what you've just heard. Um, so if you wanna enter questions in the chat box, we can answer those at this time or we can just move forward. So it's it's completely up to, completely up to you. Uh, three round trips a week, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say a day. And, and Frank, I have a question for you. So regarding the state rail plan, um, is that gonna be an update of the original state rail plan that was developed in 2010 and then updated in 2015, or are you starting from scratch? We're, sp we're starting from scratch. I mean, obviously the previous rail plans are going to be uh, referenced and, and information is going to be brought forward, but uh, we're not characterizing this as an update as much as we're characterizing it as, as uh, uh, it, it's an update in the sense that we're updating the existing plan, but we really are, are trying to do um, a, a thorough job with it. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, and then there's another question from Joseph. Any hopes that NLX will provide service via SPUD? Well, you referenced earlier, uh, Brian, the issue of providing passenger rail service between um, Target Field Station and, and Union Depot. And, you know, uh, running the second train from not, uh, not just Union Depot to, to Target Field and running NLX from not just from Target Field, but to, to uh, Union Depot is the same issue, which is the downtown to downtown stretch. And clearly the, uh, the Canadian Pacific uh, uh, portion of the route between um, um, uh, St. Paul and Minnesota Commercial is you know, relatively straightforward, but I think that we're going to be facing some challenges with BNSF in getting from uh, Minneapolis Junction to uh, the Minnesota Commercial. So um, that is why we have been asking for uh, the ability to, to work on a special downtown to downtown study. So once, uh, once we're able to move on that, then we'll be able to figure out how we can extend the services uh, to their logical termini. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and to, to David who asked about the route through Iowa, um, we, we've heard 
about that. I don't know the exact status of that route, David. Um, Iowa DOT may have more information on their website, but um, I'm not sure of the exact status of that route right now. But yes, it has been talked about and it has been um, discussed. Um, to answer Brian, Richard Wheeler. Uh, yeah, so go ahead. Brian, Brian, I was just gonna respond to, to John Dillery that uh, we haven't, um, um, we haven't selected the days of the week, and I, I see your your um, your suggestion that we should have weekends as the priority. That's certainly something that we're going to consider. Um, as I said, we're waiting for Amtrak to provide their initial proposal. We're not necessarily going to accept their initial proposal as it is, uh, but I will definitely keep that uh, keep your suggestion in mind as we talk with Amtrak. And then to or, thank you, Frank. And then in response. Richard Wheeler, um, where on, on the All Aboard Minnesota website can you find the summary of the Minneapolis to Kansas City report? If you go to our website and the Our Vision tab, open up that page and you'll see a Minneapolis to Kansas City route page. And the summary of that paper is posted there. If you have any trouble finding it, just, just send me a note through the website and I can send you the link. Hope we're getting to all the questions here. Um, is there an update for a Twin Cities to Eau Claire train? Um, yes, and Scott Rogers will be addressing that um, that service and where that stands in his part of the presentation. So, um, Brian, if I could just respond to Barry Green very quickly. Um, as you know, uh, all of the sure. um, all of the environmental requirements for the second train have been met. Um, that is not an issue as far as the environmental rules for future trains. Um, um, the only thing I can say is that the IIJA has provided for uh, new programs to support inner city trains. And I think the FRA is going to be taking a look at, um, you know, how to more efficiently select corridors. So um, I, it's hard to predict um, the environmental regulations for surrounding new trains, but uh, um, you know, more to come there. The, um, uh, to Ben Surma, um, the Minnesota is not selecting a maintenance site, but um, Amtrak does own the, um, the old um, Midway station site. Uh, we have looked at that site. It is adequate for a maintenance facility. Um, some consideration was given to providing for, ma for a maintenance facility that location for the second train, but it's really up to Amtrak to figure out how they're going to support the, the second train. Uh, and once again, that is um, one of the details in, in, the, um, in the proposal that we've been waiting to hear from Amtrak. Uh, uh, we've, had, we've been promised to, to see that report here uh, I was hoping to have had it this week. I don't, um, but that is one of the details that we'll find out more about. Great, thank you. And um, Grace, thank you for your suggestion about putting a link in the chat. I just put a link in the chat for the Minneapolis to Kansas City route page. So you can click on that and see the summary of the report that uh, the excellent study that Bob did. So. I hope we've gotten to all the questions um, so we can move on. Next slide, please. And now uh, Representative Alice Hausman will give us an overview of where passenger rail legislation stands in the house and just give us a general overview of where things are at and what's next. Representative Hausman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'll start with the good news. Um, and you've heard some of that already, but um, I want to hold right up front. Uh, some of the good news is all aboard's work. I cannot tell you how grateful I am uh, for everything you have done in the last two years. I give you full credit for helping get, get that $10 million to match the federal money for the second train to Chicago. That work you did 
uh, was just uh, phenomenal. And uh, so I just look forward to continuing that partnership. It is essential uh, for, the, uh, for forward progress. Um, and other good news, that the fact that the second train is moving faster than we um, uh, thought it would. And uh, that required uh, funding that Frank mentioned, that is in fact, um, that smaller amount is in fact in the House bill. And as you've already heard, NLX is in the House bill. Um, the, you know, a, a robust amount uh, that would be needed to keep that going. So that's the good news. The bad news is rail is partisan in Minnesota all rail, um, light rail and passenger rail. Um, if it's got the word rail in it, um, it's, it has become partisan. And in the floor debates, I've, I've always wished I could capture and, and send those films to all aboard uh, for you to understand how significantly uh, negative it is. In floor debates, we are denigrated, um, sarcastically denigrated. An example, um, Representative Doubt has said, well, it's just that they just love trains. He said, I'll, I'll give them my toy train set so they, they can play with uh, trains. I mean, it's that bad. Um, that is not the case in other Midwestern states. I'm on the commission, the Council of State Governments has a, a Midwest uh, Passenger Rail Commission. And uh, when I attend those meetings, other states are, are moving aggressively, uh, applying for federal uh, funding, and that includes states like Kansas and Texas and Missouri and Indiana, certainly uh, Illinois and Michigan, uh, all moving aggressively. And um, that Southern corridor, for example, um, I'm, I'm just so grateful to Frank for, for getting that discussion going now in MnDOT. But up until now, um, there had been action of the, the Midwest Commission was always telling me that there's action uh, south of Minnesota, but we weren't um, quite on board to have a, a state rail plan yet that, that was aggressively seeking this. So um, when, I, when I said at the Midwest Commission that in Minnesota it's uh, partisan, I got blank looks from everyone, and that includes um, uh, govern, uh, states that are governed by Republicans. Um, and finally, one person just couldn't, couldn't help anymore. He said, how is that partisan? I mean, that's literally how different other states in the Midwest are. And they are our economic competitors right now. And of course, all aboard Minnesota has demonstrated uh, to us uh, how uh, significant uh, an impact the intercity passenger rail has on um, the state's economic competitiveness. I think there's um, a, a, you know, there are a couple of reasons why, um, why we have this strong negative reaction to rail. Um, and, and those uh, disasters are recounted every time in committee and on the floor that we talk about this. One of those is the Southwest Light Rail disaster on um, the tunnel. And, and frankly, that was, a, I would say that was a mistake. You know, we have huge success on the blue line and the green line until the pandemic came along and, and cut into uh, ridership a bit. Um, but Southwest, in my opinion, they chose the wrong route. They should have never um, put it uh, in the position where they did, where they needed to have this tunnel that has turned out to be such a disaster. And the other one is uh, the mistake we made on North Star. We should have extended that immediately to St. Cloud um, because then you've got a whole other ridership base that is just substantially um, um, helpful in, uh, in ridership numbers. Uh, and then of course, there's a strange funding issue right now. Um, so now the pen, we're recovering from the pandemic and all of a sudden North Star says, we're not going to run trains for Twins games. That has been an enormously uh, successful connection. Why aren't they going to? Because Anoka County isn't coming through with it, what they believe is contracted um, financing for that line. So we have disasters uh, that, are, that are mistakes we've made. And um, they're, they're, the bad, they're the stories that critics uh, can use to say, we shouldn't be doing rail at all. We shouldn't be doing any more light rail. We shouldn't be doing passenger rail. So that's the challenge. Um, the one other challenge in this legislative session is a decision made uh, by leadership uh, to combine bills. I'll use mine as an example. I chair the housing committee. And so I was writing this housing bill and taking it through the process. And all of a sudden, they combine housing, the leadership does, of the House and the Senate, 
they combine agriculture, broadband, and housing. And now if you're an advocate, uh, there are thousands of advocates who are, um, are just very, very helpful in terms of getting us to this point. How do they keep following housing? All of a sudden, it's not, not chaired by me, it's chaired by the Ag uh, Committee Chair. So the, the process of combining bills has complicated it. In, the, in terms of transportation, Frank Hornstein is no longer chair of that uh, conference committee because it's been combined with state government finance and now Mike Nelson chairs it. And so um, when I, I t uh, have, I've been pretty openly critical of this uh, whole process, I just don't think it's gonna work well. When I talked about this in the transportation committee, it was a GOP member, uh, Petersburg, who said, well, that means people are going to be conferencing the bills who've never heard the bills. Yes, that's right. So this legislative session, that um, the process of combining bills is an extra complication with transportation. I don't know yet how that negotiation is, is going to work. Um, I, I'm probably going on too long, Brian. <laughs> um, are, is there anything else you, no, you sure that I cover? Um, if you could offer a perspective on, you know, the House Transportation Omnibus Bill and the oh, NLX oh, yes. funding and operating support. Oh, yes. oh my gosh, yes. Thank you. That was a, that was a biggie. And I, <laughs> so NLX is in the House in, is in the House bill. I said bad news. Rail is partisan. Um, that means we have an uphill battle in the Senate, and that means the fate of NLX is hugely in doubt. I have no idea. I think that that required funding, that small amount needed for the second train to Chicago, I think that may be safe just because that corridor is now uh, a definite and we're moving forward. So that small amount I think is safe, but that large amount funding L NLX, I, I have to tell you, I mean, the bad news is unless a miracle happens, I just don't see a path to success uh, for NLX in the negotiations between the House and the Senate. But do, do you think that that of that 85 million that's in the current House bill, do you think do you think we might get all half a third? If 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 you had to read the tea leaves, what would you what would you read? Well, I would think nothing <laughs> because the in this oh. the partisan nature of this, what they will basically say is we just we just uh, you know we don't believe in in that rail corridor and we're not going to support it. So I mean I'm I'm talking in big trouble. It's in big trouble. Um, the only possible um, possibility for it would be um, because Tom Bach chairs the bonding bill. Uh, and because he's retiring, and because he represents, uh, you know, has has this huge stake in northern Minnesota, if um, if the right people could get to Tom Bach and he could negotiate it in the bonding bill, um, that um, that might uh, be one path. That's the path, by the way. I'm using. I should give you this one other update. I haven't given up on funding those four studies that Frank described. Um, you you all of you see the importance of if that studying that route going south. And certainly that's the one all aboard Minnesota has always said has the, has the best um, potential for ridership and economic impact. But you've also seen the, the importance of studying what's the connection between Minneapolis and St. Paul? How are we gonna get that train to Union Depot? So there are four studies that Frank has proposed. And I think Frank, it's a $26 million um, uh, cost for all four of those studies. Um, because the, the um, Transportation Committee already has that big um, ne negotiation problem with NLX, I've been focusing my efforts there on the bonding bill. Can we get uh, general fund money in the bonding bill uh, for those four studies? Um, Fuli is getting some general fund money in addition to the GO bonding. And so I did meet with him last week. I haven't given up on that yet. I'm just hoping that um, we can figure out um, how we how we get some of that um, in the in the final in the final game? So um, hopes, but uh, but really a, a, a big uphill battle. Any other? Well, questions? great. Well, thank you. And and 
no, I think I think you've answered them. Thank you. And now we'll move on to uh, Kevin Rogenbuck. Thank you very much, Representative Hausman, for your yes. remarks. It's very helpful to understand the lay of the land. And, um, and now we we'll hear Kevin up. Rogenbuck from the great. I, I'm sorry, what was that? And we just need to keep strategizing. We don't give up, right? We just keep working. Yes, that's Kurt, exactly right. We never right. give up. Ever yes, give up. That's right. <laughs> never give up. <laughs> yeah. So so with that, we'll we'll turn it over to our great ally and partner, Great Great River Rail Commission, Mr. Kevin Rogenbuck. All right, thank you, Brian. I will share my screen and bring up my presentation and get started. All right, there we go. All right. Well, thank you. My, uh, as Brian said, my name is Kevin Rogenbuck. I'm a senior transportation planner uh, with Ramsey County Public Works. I'm also the main one of the one of the two staff people to the Great River Rail Commission. And the reason Ramsey County person is presenting to you today is because uh, Commissioner Modest Castillo, our, our chair, is not available, and neither is our vice chair. And Ramsey County is the fiscal agent to the Great River Rail Commission, so we. Uh, we have staff that, that help uh, organize agendas, set up meetings, and, and, uh, and manage our two consultants that work for us as well. So the Great River Rail Commission is comprised of officials from 16 uh, different uh, local and regional governments that extend all the way from St. Paul to La Crosse. That includes uh, cities and counties uh, between, between here and, and between St. Paul and La Crosse. Uh, we're a joint powers board, so we're organized uh, according to state statute. That means we can, we can collect dues, we can assess ourselves dues uh, to collect money and to do things that we want to do in our work program that we adopt annually. Uh, and because most of our members or some of our members are elected officials, uh, we're subject to open meeting law too. So all of our meetings are, are advertised. We have a website and we advertise those meetings that are open to the public. And we even have a, uh, a portion of our meeting that's open to public comment where people can, can ask questions of, of the commission and of the speakers that we have, that we have in our meetings. The mission of the Great River Rail Commission is to support more frequent and faster passenger train service between St. Paul and Chicago. And because our membership is, is kind of geographically sort of located along that the river route between St. Paul and La Crosse, and as it heads into Wisconsin towards Chicago, uh, our focus is, is, in, is passenger rail service in that area. And our focus uh, specifically on passenger rail service in that area has been on the Twin Cities, Milwaukee, Chicago second train. We've been advocating for that project uh, since we kind of changed our focus from high speed rail several years ago. Uh, a little bit about the advocacy work that we that we did in, in 2021 last year. We held a number of virtual town hall meetings. That was kind of an innovative idea by our communications consultant. I'll, I'll give Jeff Daler all the credit for that. That was his idea. We held three virtual town hall meetings that were uh, co-hosted by area chambers of commerce in Red Wing, in Monona, and in St. Paul, and even the Hennepin County, uh, Minneapolis, Greater Minneapolis Chamber joined us in, in hosting that that event. So we had we had these co-hosts, and we we kind of located them geographically. We tried to uh, make our presentation a little bit more focused on on those different geographic areas and draw people from those from those three areas into our into our town hall meetings to ask questions and learn about the project. We've also, we also bought radio ads on the, on the morning take with uh, Blois Olson. That's a, a program that a lot of legislators uh, tune into. So we have radio ads and legislators can hear our, hear our pitch and, and believe that it's more than just a few people uh, you know, at advocating for a project. It's, it's much bigger than that. We put together a promotional video. Uh, we also have a lobbyist that was active at the Capitol. Uh, Dennis Egan did a great job for us. Uh, he distributed a lot of literature touting the benefits of the Saint, of, of the second train uh, at St. Paul in the Capitol building. He handed things out to legislators, put them in their meeting packets, uh, gave them gave them information personally. He, we mailed them. I think we mailed a lot of these things to their home addresses too when they were on break. So they, we just we didn't let up. We, we kept uh, hitting them with information, trying to describe the benefits of this of this important project and and getting our message across to them. Uh, we also engaged our congressional delegation, uh, Commissioner Modest Castillo, uh, through through uh, in communications with Angie Craig, Representative Angie Craig, and Representative Betty McCollum, uh, talking about a number of issues. She would bring up the second train and the importance of of supporting this this important transportation um, 
uh, investment in our region and she'd bring them up with our delegation as well. Here's just an example of, of one of the many things that we put together uh, to, I guess, uh, it's, we, we put together postcards, we put together little, uh, little items that wanted to focus on some of the specific benefits of the project. And this was one that, that focused on mobility and the benefit uh, to students, especially in the Winona area. And Scott Olson, the president of State University, provided us with a, with a great quote that I think resonated with some of the more conservative legislators and, and folks in the Winona area, where he said he uses the train as the recruitment tool, not only for students, but also for faculty and well as well. So they could, they could work in Winona to take the train uh, and, and get out of town when they need to and get home to get or visit uh, others and, and be part of and maybe an adjunct faculty faculty where they live in another area and, and come in to teach uh, one class or two classes a week. And you can see that there was a survey too. MnDOT conducted a survey of college students in, in Minnesota and found that a lot of college students in the Monona State University and St. Mary's have taken the train and more said they would take the train if more frequent service were available. If the schedule was a little bit better where they could take the train home immediately after class instead of waiting till the evening or, or, or coming back so early, uh, more kids would take the train to and from school. So what's next uh, for the Great River Rail Commission? Well, uh, number one, we want to grow our membership. In, in maybe in a, in a small way, we're a, we were a victim of our own success. Uh, along with uh, All Aboard Minnesota, we advocated for funding for the second train for the state to match the federal grant that, that MnDOT and WSDOT secured. Uh, we accomplished that, and, and, as, and as soon as we did, two of our member organization counties said, uh, mission accomplished, thank you, we're, we're going to leave. So what we want to do is continue to grow our membership. Uh, we don't want to shrink. We still have work to do, so that's, that's one of our big focuses here is, is to grow our membership again. We also want to redefine our focus. As I mentioned earlier, our focus has been on, on getting capital funding and matching funds for the second train and advocating for the second train. Uh, that's a reality now. That's going to happen very soon. Uh, we need, to, we need to, to redefine our focus and our purpose. Uh, we know that uh, uh, finding a stable source of operating funds for the train could be a challenge. Uh, we, and as Representative Houseman pointed out, a lot of conservative legislators kind of conflate uh, passenger rail, commuter rail, light rail together and, and just make it a, 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 a kind of a lightning rod of contentiousness between, between uh, the two parties in the legislature. So we want to separate that. We want to make them understand that, again, the benefits of a second train of this intercity passenger rail uh, and, and there's a, a, a need for a, a continued uh, operating fund uh, from, from our state. And, and as Frank said, he's working on the operating agreement among the states to get that worked out. So we, we, have a, we think we have a role in advocating for a sustainable source of operating funds from the state of Minnesota. Uh, Amtrak, uh, if you're familiar, Amtrak's uh, put out their uh, Connect Us plan and the Federal Railroad Administration has, has issued kind of a long range plan for passenger rail service, not only in the Midwest, but throughout the, throughout the United States. And their plan and Amtrak's Connect Us plan calls for increased service in this quarter between Chicago and the Twin Cities, uh, as, as many as I believe four trains a day. So that's another focus where we can, we can stay, in, stay connected with our, our state DOT partners with Frank and Dan and, and a run in Wisconsin, stay connected with them where we can help advocate for a continued expansion of passenger rail service in this quarter and in other corridors uh, as, they, as they come kind of come online and as studies become, uh, get started up and, and, and become more of a reality. We'll continue to con cultivate our working relationships, not only with other advocacy organizations like All Aboard Minnesota, but continue to work with the state DOTs uh, and with business groups too. I think business groups will be a new focus for us where we've, we made some inroads, I think, during the legislative session where we connected with chambers of commerce and other larger businesses who recognized the benefits of the second train and the improvements that would be built to accommodate the second train also benefit freight movement greatly. And there's an economic benefit to that. And, and I think we can continue to grow support among business, the business community uh, with that aspect of our projects. And finally, we want to be able to uh, be ready to lobby the state legislature uh, for anything that's needed. And that ties back to what I mentioned earlier about operating funds for the state uh, and for the, for the second train through the state and, and just continued, I guess, defense of passenger rail, support and defense at the same time of passenger rail and the work that, that Minnesota DOT staff does for us in this regard. And 
there's our contact information uh, for, for uh, Great River Rail Commission. I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. And now we have another uh, time period for questions and answers and there. There's a couple here, um, one for Representative Hausman from John Dillery, is combining bills the way Representative Hausman describes unconstitutional in any other states? And uh, Representative Hausman, I'll let you field that question. Okay, I think Representative Hausman, <laughs> are you still with us? I am. I was having oh, sorry. I was having a little trouble um, uh, unmuting, um, and and the question was again: Is combining bills the way you described unconstitutional in any other states? So John Marty would argue that it's unconstitutional in our state, and he's already said to me next year he's going to really take this on. We have a single issue um, designation in our constitution for bills. And so uh, this has become a bad habit. It's not working. Uh, and uh, absolutely there are people in our state who believe it's unconstitutional in our state. Combining bills. Great, thank you. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, and David Overby made a statement here. Um, apparently, the solution is replacing a state-driven passenger train with a true federal system. And David, I, I, I just want to comment, you have hit upon a real sort of lightning rod, hot button issue that ever since the FAST Act that reauthorized Amtrak was uh, passed in 2008, which designated the state rail corridor and the fact that states had to pay for passenger rail service. This has been very controversial. It has been talked about uh, to be repealed that that Amtrak as it was originally created was created as a national federal system designed to provide passenger rail service throughout the U.S. And so, so that you've touched upon a topic that could take, you know, an entire meeting's breadth in and of itself. And so it is controversial, it is a hot button issue, and, and it's, it's, it's something that, um, you know, is, is being discussed. It, that part of the law that was passed in 2008 has not been changed, um, but there is possibility for it. So if there are developments that that happen, we will definitely keep you posted because it definitely affects what we're doing here. So thank you for making the statement. Any other questions? George Davis, I've heard some concern that freight railroads do not want passenger rail because these railroads are so congested now and we much wanna keep the rails open for moving grain trains to market. So Frank Lauderly, I don't know if you wanna address that question. Well, just like Alice trying to get to uh, trying to get to the unmute button here. Um, so, yes, that is an issue with the uh, with the uh, freight railroads. Um, but uh, um, the in the case of a, a, a railroad like BNSF, just to use that as an example, they uh, um, they have what they call their passenger rail principles in. Uh, officially, they say that we're willing to uh, operate passenger trains uh, if we are able to um, provide, if, if, if the sponsoring agency is willing to provide the um, capital improvements that allow freight trains to operate uh, without interference from the passenger trains and vice versa. So the approach that we've taken both with TCMC and with NLX is that, <clears throat> you know, we we conduct analyses uh, through uh, computer modeling of operations to identify the existing traffic and future traffic and, and uh, figure out, well, what is it that we, what are the bottlenecks? What are the spots? Uh, where, where do we need new sightings and so forth? And so the, the whole, when, when we talk about 
the capital cost for TCMC and the capital cost for NLX, we're largely talking about the improvements that the railroads are asking for that will allow us to operate our passenger trains reliably on schedule without materially impacting uh, their freight trains. So um, yes, the freight railroads have that concern. Uh, we do try to address that in our work, in our analysis, in our negotiations with them. Great, thank you, Representative Hausman and Frank for your answers. Um, and now it's time for Scott Rogers, who chairs the West Central Wisconsin Rail Coalition and is also a part of the Midwest Interstate Rail Passenger Coalition to give, an, give us an update on what's happening around us in the Midwest from passenger rail development perspective. So uh, Scott Rogers, you are on. All right, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, uh, Brian, for the opportunity and uh, to talk about these things today. Um, my name is Scott Rogers. I'm the Vice President of Governmental Affairs at the Eau Claire Area Chamber of Commerce, just uh, east of uh, Minnesota. Uh, as uh, Brian mentioned, I'm also Chair of the West Central Wisconsin Rail Coalition. And then I guess my role today really is more uh, in my position as one of the commissioners for the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission representing Wisconsin. Uh, the commission has already been mentioned by uh, by a couple people already, including Representative Hausman, who is also a commissioner. Uh, each state uh, that participates can appoint up to four people, two from the legislature and two appointed by the governor. And in my case, I'm the private sector uh, representative for the state of Wisconsin. Um, Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission, if you're not familiar with it, is essentially the successor to the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative. You may remember from uh, the 1990s, which um, uh, talked about developing uh, passenger rail service in the upper Midwest. Uh, the, this commission was actually formed by compact among the states in 2000, and uh, each state actually passed legislation uh, creating the commission, appointing commissioners, uh, contributing to the budget, uh, et cetera. Uh, the current uh, states that are participating are Illinois, Indiana, uh, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, North Dakota, and Wisconsin. And as Representative Hausman mentioned, many of those states uh, are uh, led by Republican uh, governments. And so when we have our meetings, we have states like Kansas, Indiana, North Dakota, Missouri, where those legislative re representatives are Republicans and they're very involved in, and positive about a uh, passenger rail service in their states. Uh, the role of the commission really is to coordinate interaction among those states in developing passenger rail service uh, helping to look at how plans can work across state lines. Um, it also provided the legislative authority for some of the Midwest states to jointly own, uh, manage and maintain equipment. So uh, if you've heard of the venture cars that are in the process of going into service that were built by Siemens, uh, also the fleet of locomotives, uh, that was done through the authority here. Um, we understand they are starting service on the Chicago to St. Louis corridor. Uh, they will soon be in service in Chicago to, to Milwaukee. And in fact, Wisconsin ha had an additional um, order for us, I believe it's six more coaches and three cab cars that'll be coming online um, a little bit uh, later. Uh, so some of the latest developments, the uh, MIPRC commission meets in person about once a year. Uh, most recently uh, we met uh, in Chicago and Detroit uh, last fall. In Chicago, there was actually a news conference for the release of the FRA Midwest plan that has already been mentioned as well. It's a, it's a very long-term 40-year outlook for where passenger rail service might develop in the Midwest. What's notable for our region is that the Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison, Twin Cities route was identified as uh, one that uh, had the justification for future a true high-speed rail core express as that moves forward. Um, so that FRA study was initiated in part because of the request uh, by the MIPRC. And so some of the next steps uh, on that um, are for legs, if you will, to be put on, uh, put some tracks on that study. Uh, it's very long range, very high level. And the commission uh, is working on with a consultant to do a, a grant request to take that study and then look at the various state rail plans in the Midwest, that study, 
and develop a uh, implementation plan for it. And that really dovetails with something happening with the uh, IIJA or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which we really haven't had time to talk about today, but that's that unprecedented uh, federal uh, investment that is coming over the next five years. Uh, it does include a corridor identification program uh, that will roll out over five years. And FRA, we understand, will be coming out with its rules and process for what that's going to look like sometime in May. So that's something we'll be uh, anticipating. Um, the IIJA also uh, includes provisions that increase the importance of interstate commissions. And so the MIPC, uh, MIPRC right now is uh, working on how that will, uh, will play into effect for our Midwest states. But we actually are one of two already existing entities that already qualify as commissions uh, under the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, so the commission um, next meeting is tentatively being planned for November after the election. And uh, we're looking at doing it in normal Illinois where uh, that's on the Chicago to St. Louis corridor where they've had a significant uh, development in that city because of the corridor and new station facilities there and their downtown. And in fact, their, uh, their mayor, I believe, was just uh, nominated for, uh, for the Amtrak board. Uh, other things that are going on, uh, uh, Frank Letterly talked about the uh, Minnesota rail plan, Wisconsin DOT right now is doing its plan internally, its plan update. Uh, we understand that they will be releasing their drafts sometime this uh, spring or early summer, and then there'll be some uh, public outreach. And then the Amtrak Connexus plan was also mentioned, and we do understand that uh, for um, Minnesota and Wisconsin, that Amtrak is actively right now doing analysis of that uh, of the routes that are on the Wisconsin State Rail Plan in particular, which would include uh, ways to obtain service for Madison, uh, the corridor up to the Fox Cities and Green Bay, uh, service to and through uh, Eau Claire as well, and, and that will be out uh, likely uh, sometime uh, this year. Um, and then uh, Frank also mentioned the uh, agreement between Amtrak and Canadian Pacific. Uh, it's also a little bit broader for Wisconsin. Um, it does allow for an eighth Hiawatha as some of the Hiawatha service between Chicago and Milwaukee as some of the current uh, improvements are being done in, uh, in Wisconsin, which include a second platform at uh, the Milwaukee uh, airport station, the freight bypass in, the, in, uh, in, Milwaukee, in Milwaukee itself and some other improvements. Um, and then uh, I've had a chance to look at that agreement and it also does include uh, provisions for the third uh, Chicago to Twin Cities train as the uh, current um, uh, planned capital improvements uh, are made. Uh, finally, uh, the question actually was asked about uh, the Eau Claire to Twin Cities corridor. Uh, one of the developments there is uh, within the last year, uh, three of the counties, um, uh, St. Croix, Dunn, and Eau Claire, and six municipalities, including Altoona, Eau Claire, Menominee, uh, New Richmond, and Hudson, passed resolutions to form the uh, Chippewa St. Croix Passenger Rail Commission. In fact, um, Kevin has been a little bit helpful with us there, sharing some things about the Great River Commission and how it's uh, organized. Uh, the commission just met uh, last week uh, and uh, passed its bylaws and is planning to have its first in-person meeting uh, sometime in May and we're in the process of, of getting that uh, set. So we continue to work on that and uh, there's a lot of interest and excitement in, the, uh, in our area and throughout Wisconsin for uh, future passenger rail service. So those are a few uh, quick updates uh, about what's going on that I know about and, and uh, can answer any questions when we get to that uh, next section as well. Great, Brian, thank you very much. Brian, and so I with that- Brian, I see one of the concerns expressed in yeah, the go chat. Ahead. It, one of the concerns expressed in the chat is one that I share, and that is all of those other states that have their act together and that, that are acting in a, a bipartisan way uh, are ready to move ahead and apply for all of that federal money available. We have more federal money available for passenger rail than I think we've historically had. And that's why I haven't given up yet on, the, on funding those four studies that Frank talks about, because Frank says, we can't apply for that federal money until we get those four studies done. So 
um, my motivation is there to see how can we get that funding before the end of this session. If I could make a comment too, I appreciate that. And one of the things maybe that's worth emphasizing too is the that the the money available in the IIJA, first of all, it is competitive grants. So that's that's a challenge. But one of the programs that was included that maybe hasn't been talked about as much, the TCMC is uh, taking advantage of the previous restoration enhancement grant program, but in the new bill, it's even better. So there's a six year declining uh, federal support for operating side. And it actually is 90% the first year and then it goes down, but it gives the states and localities a lower, um, lower entry point and much less financial risk in getting a new service started. So that might be, provide some persuasion in terms of the risk to a state or a locality in getting a service started. Great, thank you. Any other questions that anybody else has? This concludes sort of the formal part of our program. And so we do have a few minutes left for questions, if anybody has any. It doesn't look like anybody else has any questions. So it, 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 so I'll just make a final comment with the IIJA that, that we've just been discussing. Uh, there is $66 billion for passenger rail um, in, in several major buckets. One was for the long distance network. A lot of money is appropriated for the Northeast Corridor and infrastructure development. And then a lot of money was appropriated as Scott Rogers just pointed out for competitive grants for passenger rail corridors, state corridors. We did detail out those buckets of money in a previous communication that is posted on our website in our blog, if you wanna take a look at that. But um, that may have changed since that uh, particular communication. But um, anyway, we have detailed it and we'll keep you posted as developments occur. So I just wanted to make that sort of final comment. But again, we really appreciate your support. Thank you for attending this meeting this morning. We hope that you found this informative and uh, uh, we really appreciate your support. So. Thank you all very much. And it doesn't look like there are any other questions unless I'm missing anything. Um, so great, well, thank you. Thank you all very much. We appreciate your support and attendance and we will keep you posted as things happen throughout the year. And thank you to all of our speakers, appreciate it.